Hello, guys, and welcome to um, the show. Um, this is a special interview I'm doing, and um, I'm happy to uh, welcome uh, the keyboardist of a band from the 70s and 80s called New Music, and uh, he's here with me now. Uh, can you please welcome Clive Gates? How are you, Clive? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing, Frank? Very good, Clive. Thank you. Yeah, very nice for you to be here. Thank you very much oh, for doing this. Pleasure. Uh, Right, we have a lot of questions uh, to okay. get through here, Clive. So, um, which thanks to the um, New Music Discussion Group on Facebook for allowing me to um, put the word out for this interview. Okay. And uh, you will respond, a lot of you responded to this, so I'm very grateful. Um, so, uh, first of all, though, I'd like to thank um, your friend, uh, uh, Simon Croft, for his help in getting this interview organised with me. So special thanks to to Simon. Yeah, he's uh, yeah he's a, he's a, he's a good friend of mine, Simon. We've known each other since our school days. So uh, yeah, uh, I, I I concur with that as well. To be honest with you. Right, let's go for let's go for the questions, Clive. Um, yep. Right, the first one is from uh, Michael Bond, and he asks, um, "How did new music come together?" Okay, no straightforward answer to this because obviously you, you work in parallel. You have this, you know, there was me, there was Tony at one point, and that was in my mum's uh, house making a racket. Uh, we were 14, 15 at the time. Could you call that the start of new music? It was certainly at the start of a relationship. But Tony formed a band called End of the World at some point. They did a lot of uh, pub gigs, etc. And I suppose eventually it morphed into new music through our association with TMC Studios in Tooting. Uh, you won't be surprised to know that of the band members, three of the four went to Spencer Park School. I was the odd one out that I went to Wandsworth School. Um, so it was somewhat to some extent Tooting focused, school focused. Um, I know that is not an exact answer, but there is no straight route to it, to be honest with you. You've, I remember you recently posted a picture of you and Simon Croft and Tony together in a band yeah. you ha were in called Riemann Zegers. That's correct, yeah. That, uh, that was one of uh, Tony's early uh, incarnations. Uh, yeah, you could say that was almost like the start of it in a way. That was, a, yeah, the, the gig at the North East London Polytechnic. No drummer. A uh, bit of a challenge that was. I'm not quite sure we were ready for it then. But uh, they did say your first live gig is hardly your best one. <laughs> uh, but it was it was an interesting experience for us, most certainly. I believe there was a, a, um, a um, you actually recorded a demo with of Riemann Zegers. Do you know if that, that if that still exists? Yeah, there I do remember. I, I Tony would have those, not me. Uh, I remember he because he, he actually funded it. Uh, yeah, we did it at a studio in Fulham. It was a four track job. Uh, yeah, I do remember that. What would I have been? 15 uh, at the time uh, and Tony 16. Yeah, I do recall those. Again, that's something uh, Tony would need to be approached about as to whether he would be prepared to release those or not because they're kind of like in his control. Were they original original songs or cover yeah, versions? Yeah. They were, yeah, yeah. No, I remember All one. originals? Yeah, yeah, they were. They were written by Tony. You're Real Wild, Satan's Child was one of them. Yeah. Uh, a, a bit of T-Rex influence there by the sound of things. Um, and a few other ones uh, kind of escaped me. Yeah, that would be me, Simon Croft, Tony Mansfield. Uh, did the drummer turn up? I can't remember. Uh, we had a guy called Ollie Limbury on clarinet as well, which was uh, rather amusing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, they, they are about somewhere. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting to see, you know, just the young versions of yourself back then, even younger oh, than you yeah. were in new music, you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll see if I got any photographs at the time because we did take some in the studio, all looking very young. Uh, but uh, and that was an interesting experience as well. My yeah. first use of a Davoli synthesizer as well, which I didn't tune properly, so it sounded a little bit painful. But again, it's <laughs> part of the learning process. Was that the, <laughs> was that the first time you you guys were in the studio? Uh, I think it was, yes, it was, yeah, four track, I think, uh, you know, and it had a spring reverb and it had a plate reverb. So, you know, state of the art stuff at the time. Okay, that's a, that's a really good answer, Clive. Thanks for that, because that's no. one that not many people know too much about, no, you know. No, indeed, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, um, 
here's a question, right? So this is going to, I'm going to kind of bunch these together as one yeah. question, really, because a lot of people have asked a very similar question about unreleased tracks and so on of new music. Yeah. But I'll start, I'll start the ball rolling with uh, Jonas Warstad. Oh, yeah. Um, and, then, and then I'll kind of just sort of elaborate, sort of extend that question so it's kind of fits the other ones. Um, on Anywhere, there were yeah. several tracks um, that were later released, but they weren't on the original album. There was four tracks that were added, you know, later. Yeah. Uh, were there any more unreleased tracks for that LP and any chance that they will be released? And also this, this sort of applies to the other two albums as well, from A yeah. to B and uh, Warp. Okay, this is going to sound like a cop-out on my behalf, but obviously I don't own the copyright to any of that material. And there's always, when you record an album, as I recall it, what tends to happen is you record more than you need, then you select the best ones. So there are, I'm almost certain, tracks that are lying around that weren't deemed appropriate or good enough at the time for release. Um, I don't have possession of those. Again, if anyone would do, it would be Tony M, not me. So... Uh, it would be kind of down to him as to whether or not a they exist still and b whether he was prepared for anyone to listen to him so i'm sorry that i can't answer that one directly but there's almost certainly something knocking about yeah interesting stuff yeah so i hope that satisfies most of the people that asked that question yeah. because i wish it could be a bit more definitive with that to be honest with you but that's the honest answer as far but as you're not aware of any songs um that it, from memory that you recorded that did were never put out I'm not aware, only because it was, what, 40-odd years ago? Or yeah, whatever. yeah. You know, so, you know, my, my memory fades to some extent over that period of time. Sure, sure. Okay, here's an, um, a question from uh, Paul Parker. Yeah. And he asks you, uh, first, he's got twofold, two questions, sorry. Um, first one is, what's your favourite new music track? Yeah, okay. Favourite new music track is, I think it's probably from A to B, and that's a map of you. I didn't have anything directly to do with that track, but I like the fact that it's 12 beats to the bar. It's unusual. I like the concept of Map of You, You Are Here, which you often see on, uh, you know, you're going to a park or something and it says, You Are Here. There's a little arrow there. I'm yeah, sure yeah. Making an allusion to that in the track. And it's just an unusual track, unusual time signature, uh, unusual chords. So good stuff. That, that That's probably my favourite. Although, you know, it wasn't ever released as a single. It's... Uh, it's, it's, it's a really good one, I think. And he also asks you, um, do you know if tape loops were used on drum tracks, such as Changing Minds, for instance? No, that's just robotic fill. Uh, <laughs> I remember Changing Minds, yeah. No, that's just Phil. Uh, he, you know, he was like human metronome, that guy, and he was often telling me off for not being tight enough at the time. So, no, that's down to Phil, Phil Towner. No tape loops used, as I am aware, as far as I'm aware. And uh, Anthony Johnson asks you, what were your mu musical influences at the time of new music? And was Tony M usually influenced by David Bowie? Uh, he would have been influenced, like we all were, by David Bowie, most certainly. Uh, he was also very much influenced by Abba's production values as well. So, you know, lots of the octaves used... Um, on themes, etc., which are quite prevalent in a lot of the new music stuff. If you listen to ABBA, you will hear that there is a quite a correlation there. And also their stuff was so brilliantly produced at the time. I think they would be an inspiration for anybody. Even to this day, their stuff still sounds really wonderful production-wise. So I'd have to say ABBA. There, of course, can be others. There was The Cure, you know, uh, the, the kind of minimalist approach, which you hear more on the second album, The Absence of Symbols, um, and hi-hats, which to some extent is also um, an influence of Peter Gabriel, if you remember his solo stuff. Yeah. A lot of that didn't have cymbals or drums in it. I think it was only when the album so came out that his co-producer insisted, let's use hi-hat, let's use cymbal. Um, so, yeah, I'd say they were the main influences. Yeah, another question here from uh, Patio Adio. I, I, forgive me if I'm messing these names up but it was a similar question about uh, I, i'm only putting his name out because he only had one question to ask me whereas the others had several questions and that that one to do with unreleased tracks was in there as well but yeah. i didn't want to leave the man's name out here okay. and it, he, he just asked a similar thing would it ever be possible for a compilation album of unreleased archive tracks b-size extended versions etc 
to be released again that probably down to tony or the oh uh, yeah very much so yeah i mean he, he he you know when you're looking at these sort of copyright and legal issues it would be down to him i don't have any control over that i'd be nice to think it would be uh i know tony keeps a very open mind about these sort of things and if he thought there was irrelevant or an opportunity or an appropriate it's something i know he would consider Danny Butler asks, uh, in some TV appearances, you gave a rather unusual mind performance uh, that comes across to me as your version of Sparks' Ron M Mayles' unusual performance. Was that the idea, and how do you feel about it now? Uh, I do wince a bit when I see some of those now. I think I might have been a little bit over the top. I know that a couple of our uh, parents said, what are you playing that prancing around like that? But some of the producers quite liked it. You know, the floor managers did. When we did Magpie years ago, they, they said, oh, ham it up a bit. That's great. So I kind of fed off of that to some extent. But uh, what was I trying to be like? I don't know. Originally, it was going to be like Bobby Crush with a wink and all that sort of thing because it looked so cheesy. And we thought we'd incorporate that into the act. But I look back and then think, mm, I think I've done things a little bit more subtly now. But, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Isn't it just? <laughs> ah, yeah. Um, uh, here's a question from Ralph Mellon. Um, are you still in contact with Tony M and the other band members? And can you give some some memories of working with them? Yeah. Well, working with them, you know, we uh, we toured. We got much better. Um, you know, it was a very disciplined environment, to be honest with you, studio and live. We wanted to be tight. We wanted to be in tune. So it was very much work. Uh, we used to have a good time afterwards, you know, a few beers and all the rest of it, particularly after a good gig. As to who I'm in touch with, I see Tony Hibbert regularly. He's a good buddy of mine. Uh, I see him quite a lot and, uh, you know, socially. And he's got a little keyboard. And so we'll often, if I'm back at his place, have a few jamming sessions together. Uh, nothing too serious. Tony Mansfield, I hear from him occasionally, but as you may be aware, he's a very private in individual and one has to respect that. Uh, Phil Turner, sadly, I've lost track of him completely. I don't know where he is. I've tried to yeah, Google him, etc., but no joy. So if anyone happens to know where he is, I'd, I'd be pleased to know his whereabouts. And wouldn't we all? Yeah, yeah indeed. Um, H. Cook asks you, um, is there any... It's a big one, really, I suppose, really. Uh, is there any chance of new music following ABBA's example, but without them being virtual you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, members that. on stage, obviously? We want to yeah. see you for real, uh, uh, all of you, Clive, not, not virtual members, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and reforming for a one-off album and tour. Yeah, I, I think that's unlikely. You'd need, to, well, you need the cooperation of three of the four, uh, at least. Uh, and again, why not leave things the way they were? It's a good memory. You know that ABBA thing, for example, I know they did it virtually, that backfired on them because the album was slated and um, it wasn't particularly good in my opinion compared to their previous stuff. I hate to think that if you reformed, even if it was new material or the old stuff, we'd probably play much better as musicians now than we did in the past. I certainly am a, a more competent keyboard player than I used to be. But will I think it happens? I think it's unlikely, but one should never say never. Absolutely not. And Tony, if you're listening by any chance, which is possible, yeah. um, we would love to see you guys get back together. There's, there's a, <laughs> there is a hunger for it, you know, uh, yeah. and uh, there are a lot of people that are incredibly influenced by the sound of new music to this day, you know. Um, yeah. So it would be a wonderful Please, thing Tony. if you did yeah. decide to do that. You know? Yeah, indeed. So if, he, if you're listening, Tony. Yes. Hopefully, yes. Uh, <laughs> indeed. Uh, uh, okay, this is from Jason. Um What's the, the last thing New Music did as a four-piece back when signed to GTO? And how did things exactly end with GTO or the band as such? OK, I can't recall what was the last tracks that we did. GTO Records was bought out, I think, by CBS Records, and we were put on the Epic label. And so it was something that we didn't really have any control over. It was done at the highest corporate level. So other acts who were also signed to GTO would have been moved over to CBS Records. Uh, I remember going to their offices in Soho Square. Well, in fact, very near where GTOs were, if I remember rightly. Um, so I'm sorry that I can't give you a definitive answer over what the last stuff was we did with GTO, but the move to Epic was something beyond our control. 
Uh, Julian Newton um, w- wants to ask you, um, who were your musical influences growing up and what do you think of current music these days? And do you have any favourite current bands or artists? Yeah, well, again, I'm going to really sound my age now. My, I mean, uh, growing up, we liked King Crimson. We liked, yes, we liked prog rock, but we also liked, or Tony liked T-Rex. We all liked Bowie. Going back even further, it was the Beatles because, you know, they were just so iconoclastic and unique. Um, look, showing my age, one of my favourite albums is OK Computer, and that's celebrating its 25th uh, anniversary at the moment. To me, that sounds like it was made yesterday. Uh, and uh, as you know, there are a lot of celebrations over this very unusual and rather uh, ahead of its time album. Um, so I just think the stuff that's bang up to date now, I don't really have a view on a lot of that. A lot of it's done on an iPhone. You don't need to necessarily learn your instrument or write songs. You can get your beats off the internet. And mm-hmm. also, I can't stand auto-tune. So oh, I'm yeah. going to sound like an old fuddy-duddy here, but a lot of the stuff in the charts at the moment doesn't do anything for me, to be honest with you. Auto-tune, yeah, that's, that's a bit of a... I have a bit of a problem with that too. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's so ubiquitous as well now. You hear it on everything. Uh, so... I'm afraid I can't give you a really good answer as to what I like today because I probably don't listen that much to it, to be honest with you. You know, I listen to Adele and stuff like that and when we have our play-alongs at home uh, because I have um, a member of my family, um, my daughter, who's an extremely good singer, will play something like, you know, the Dylan track, what is it, to make you feel my love, etc. But, you know, that's just kind of entertainment. It's not anything that I would take to heart or anything like that. Uh, Pete D asks you, um, you are regularly seen in photos and promo videos of the time with Two Profit Five Cents. Yep. And uh, I believe Tony did most of the first album with Rolling Jupiter 4 and a Selena string machine. But how much of the second album was done on Profit Five? And did you get to program any of your own patches? Okay. Now, I stand corrected here, as I often have to be because of the, uh, the time difference, uh, you know, the many years that have passed. I'm not sure about the Juno 4. Uh, I don't remember a Juno 4. The Profit 5 was used on A to B. If you listen to Living by Numbers, that's Profit 5 through and through. A CS80 Yamaha was also used, which was the first polyphonic synth in production, I recall. Uh, there would have been a Selena string synth used as well. A Korg 700S was also used to get that really rasping bass sound that you've got on islands. Um, so the Profit 5 was used on the first album and on the second, but also we had an Overheim OB-8, a Jupiter 8. It started to get more kick for the second and the third albums. So it expanded. As for a Juno 4, I'm not really, really not sure what that is, to be honest. No, he said a, a Jupiter 4. No, I think a Jupiter 8 we would have used, but not on the first album, possibly right. the second or third. It's had a more kind of like brassy analog sound. Um, so that is my recollection of it. And did you, did you use your own patches? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I read the manual, and I remember it. Congratulations on buying this Profit 5. And it was by Dr. Tom Data. And what I did, you know, the Profit 5 was laid out in front of you. You had your low-frequency oscillator, had your filter, your ADSL, and you could just see it all, you know, in front of you. So you could follow the process very simply. Um, so you could take a factory preset, and you would uh, you tweak it, get the sound you wanted, and go for that and record it. By the way, I do recall one occasion where just prior to the gig, one the Profit 5 I was using, it lost everything. It lost a lot. We had half an hour to go on stage, and what you would do is store it in cassette tape in those days. There was not enough time to transfer the information on cassette tape, which was highly unreliable then, onto the Profit 5. So I frantically reprogrammed it with some generic sounds. That's a string sound. That's a plinky plonky sound. That's a piano sound. So that could go wrong. Remember tapes? Uh, you know, that was the backup. If you had a Sinclair ZX81 like I did, what was often the case was everything was dumped onto a cassette and that could be unreliable. A little bit of a glitch on that tape and the thing wouldn't load. So, uh, but yes, we did uh, definitely use our own sounds, our own patches. Uh, Th- Thomas uh, Skogsberg asks, I wonder if you know how Tony feels today. Now, I'm not sure what, exactly what he means. Maybe, maybe it may be a twofold question. He may mean how, it, how, how is he feeling today or how he feels his um, music has 
uh, you know, endured or, or affected people. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I mean, this is just my own subjective opinion here, how Tony feels, because obviously only he knows that. I know he's aware that the legacy he created is respected uh, and, and, and has stood the test of time. And uh, that's something that I also share in. He, he has always been very interested in what's going on currently. So he would be far my, well up to date compared to me on what's going on at the moment. And he always likes to keep ahead of the curve, as they say. I know it's a bit of a business cliche these days. So I suspect he's probably been quite content with things in life, to be honest with you. Uh, again, that's something you'd have to ask him uh, for any further details. Oh, that's easier said than done, Clive. Yeah, <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know, I know, yeah. Um, Bengt A. Paulson asks you, um, again, it was about how much unreleased material is there in the vaults, but this one, he did elaborate a wee bit, and he said, uh, from either new music or later projects. Um, so later projects might involve, might involve yourself. Can yeah. you... Shed some light on that, Clive. Uh, later projects, what with Tony or separate from Tony? Well, with Tony, all your all, these, all your all separate. Yeah, well, I did uh, do a number of things on my own. I used TMC downtime, uh, and I was still in new music, and I was developing my own stuff. I've still got those. Uh, well, I've got the eight tracks, and that's something that Simon Croft and I are working on at the moment. So you've got to watch this space for that because I'm using Simon's editing skills to try and make it sound somewhat more uh, 21st century, to put it mildly. Although he suggests we should still keep the flavour of the 1980s. So that's something that will be coming eventually. Uh, but that's me solo. That is not me or Tony or Tony and others. That's interesting. Yeah. I did hear one track um, that may be, you know, a future taster of that stuff you did on your own, but it was called Things Need Maintenance. Oh, the instrumental track, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, because somebody, I think it was Brian Nupp, he, he got hold of an acetate, I think, for that. Uh, yeah, well, you know what? That was, to some extent, experimental. The idea was that I wanted it to sound like a kind of like, what, how can you put it, like a kind of like a James Bondy type thing. But it didn't quite come out like that, to be honest with you. Again, you know, I look back on it, I think Phil's drumming on it is really good. And yes... I do stand corrected. It is Phil on that drumming, uh, you know, doing his kind of like YMO stuff. Uh, so really that was experimental to some extent, you know, uh, really is an instrumental. Uh, could more be done on it? Would I have done it differently? Yes, of course I would. But uh, it, was, it was good fun at the time. And uh, here's a question from Paul Grooveside. I'd like to know about how you develop the synthesizer sounds for new music and also companies these days are making profit five patches where you can buy the sounds of your favorite artists. Yeah. Would you consider doing this through a company or independently? Yeah. Well, I suppose I would. First of all, I've got to get hold of a profit five because obviously we've got software that can emulate it now, but I'm not really up to speed when it comes to using um, um, uh, technology. I'd rather have a profit five in front of me. And if I did, then I could recreate those sounds because it's kind of like embedded into my memory how I did it. I can still actually see the layout of the keyboard in front of me now. Um, so, yeah, I consider that. If someone says, oh, I want to sound X, can you reproduce it for me? Yeah, but can you provide me with a Profit 5 as well, which is uh, easier said than done these days because I understand they're quite hard to get hold of. Oh, yeah, I would think so. And I would imagine they're very expensive now too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. And I'd be scared they'd just pack up. But presumably there's a whole industry of people out there who can repair these legacy synthesizers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in a way, I wish I'd kept it. I wish I'd kept my Profit 5 and my world. It's a noisy thing, though, it was. And I also had, at one point, when we used to do the pubs, a Logan string synthesizer. Not as good as a Selena, but I couldn't quite afford a Selena at the time. Um, yeah, I wish I'd kept those. Oh, so I didn't have a Profit 5 in the pub days. I had a cool 700S. Ah, uh -huh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was it? Was it the um, interest? Was it the uh, the uh, uh, um, the profit fives that you you would have used for 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 touring with the group? Right. Okay. So initially, we had two profit fives, but we took a huge, great CP eight seventy or CP eighty electric grand piano with us. Very difficult for the road crew. It also needed tuning frequently because uh, that. You know, because it was a, what an electromechanical device. Um, so 
we took that and then we thought hang on a minute we don't need this so that was sold and we ended up i could recreate a lot of those piano sounds on a profit five itself it made life a lot easier so two profit fries taken on the road and also when we toured tony would often play himself on stage i think it was an oberheim an ob8 um on stage as well so at one point we had three cents but two profits is what i tended to use that that was sufficient really I know there was another question here, um, Clive, which I'm just trying to locate at the moment. Um, uh, that was uh, an intriguing one. It was about when, when you were working, um, when you were doing, actually doing the live circuit um, yeah. group. Yeah. Ah, here we go. Right, I wanted to, to include this. This was from Aidan Gabriel, I believe. He's from Tel Aviv. All um, right. Okay. Uh, he said, regarding the new music live shows, yeah. uh, how did the band adapt the songs from Tony's arrangements that were based on a lot of his studio production tricks and yeah. translate that to the stage? Yeah. What musical elements were left out and what equipment was used on stage, i.e. the synths, Simmons drums, CR78, Roland VP330 and so on? Okay, so what, what, what we did uh, is, well, we, would, we used a real kit, I think, in the end it was you know it sounded better a real kit than a simmons kit yeah um there's a lot of acoustic guitar on the new music stuff tony opted to actually use an electric guitar instead of that he did have an adama 12 string that he used as well which sounded and looked amazing but if we were doing say living by numbers it wasn't da -da -da -da. it wasn't an acoustic guitar but it down down uh, an electric guitar so you know it, would, it was actually probably sounded more rocky than poppy to be honest with you looking back on it but it also depended on the mood you know what tour we were doing uh we did have a habit of doing things a little bit faster on stage uh as a lot of bands did in those days something i wouldn't recommend now because obviously you really want to recreate it the way you did it in the studio but so many people sped things up and we we, we were as guilty of that as anybody at the time uh bass was bass i'm just looking at us on stage at the moment and try to think how did we adapt? Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, you know, you don't cover everything because it, you know there were a, there's a lot of production in that new, new music stuff. But the idea was just to create a vibe, a mood that uh, was as good as you can get with four musicians on stage without any jiggery pokery. So, two proper fives, electric guitar, sometimes an Oberheim, bass guitar, and drums. That was about it, really. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. No outboard gear. And what kind of audience came to the show? Was it a very mixed crowd, uh, well, age group-wise, and men and women? Well, the uni tours were students. Uh, yeah. And, you know, they're, they're a really good crowd, particularly if you go to places like, you know, Glasgow, et cetera, although you can get a, you know, be careful what you say, because uh, I remember we uh, played Strathclyde University and uh, we're saying, oh, you know, it's great to be in Glasgow and blah, blah, blah. People say, get on with it stop talking crap and all the rest of it uh, <laughs> uh and i think i can't say i blame them to be honest with you um although we did enjoy glasgow in fact i love scotland and we went to some uh st andrews and i remember we ate in the uh um the hotel overlooking the golf club eating venison what the hell is this stuff you know bloody hell uh so yeah quite an experience uh, they were predominantly young uh, and they were predominantly students because they were the sort of gigs you want to do. I mean, the uni circuit is just brilliant, you know. And and a lot of the entertainment officers who were responsible, they often went on to do pretty sort of significant things within the music business within their own right. So, uh, yeah, predominantly students, I would say. And do you think there are any still any live recordings out there that exist? Oh, you know what? That's one great thing. I know that when we did our last gig at the venue, Pete Hammond was actually our sound engineer. Uh, there is a recording of that. I can't recall where it is. I don't know. I don't want to repeat Tony M again, but he may well have a copy of that. I certainly don't have any. You know, it's really ridiculous. Back in those days, the, the concept of recording stuff, we would do it um, just to check that we were actually playing okay. Uh, but, you know, nowadays it would be inconceivable to do a gig without recording it. But that wasn't always the case then, sadly. And lastly, Clive, I just I, I noticed recently that you were putting a few little um, things up on the the uh, new music discussion page uh, uh, on Facebook, uh, sort of things you found um, yeah. 
in the attic, as it were? Yes, look, that's correct. It was uh, boxes out of the attic. And what I've got them, what I've done now is I've actually physically stored them downstairs, which forces me to go through them. And I picked up a few things that I've posted on the uh, Facebook page, you know, pictures and things. I do have some VHS cassettes. Don't hold your hopes up too high because I'm not sure what's on them. Uh, I need to get hold, A, of a VHS player. And then when I've done that and I've checked what's on there, uh, if it's a, if it's relevant, then I'm happy for someone to actually convert that to digital if they've got the uh, gubbins to do that and post it on the uh, on, on the page. So I just ask you to bear with me so I can establish what's on them. So that's where I'm coming from. Hopefully, you know, because one smart new music, I went through one of them and all it was was a load of bloody soap operas. <laughs> <coughs> I know, uh, you know, you know, EastEnders, Emma Dow. I've got a feeling it might have been my mum who went over, but I'm pretty sure she didn't actually erase new music stuff. I haven't gone through right to the end of this thing yet. There's going to be something on there, but I do have another, a couple of other ones. I know if you recall, you know, what I do is get a cassette, I write on it, and write something else on it, write something else on it. Um, and I know I wouldn't have erased any of the new music stuff. It's just laying my hands on it. So, that's work in progress, but it is something I will pursue because I personally like to know what's on them. And um, we all would, yeah, absolutely. That would be. Uh, we'll, keep, we'll all keep our fingers crossed that there's some yeah. some interesting stuff there. Yeah, and I, I would certainly let you know if there's anything worth converting to digital. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, I think we're keeping our fingers crossed there, Clive. <laughs> okay, yeah, and so am I. And you'll be the first to know, Frank, if I find anything. Oh yeah, and put it on the uh, put it up on the fa- the new music page. Yeah, yeah, um, I shall. yeah, yeah. But I will be looking for someone to convert it. That's the only thing. Yeah, that, that's that's where I can't help you, unfortunately. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think there was somebody who did say, "Well, I'll convert it." Um, uh, so I, I'll take it from there. Let's see, you know, one step at the time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a little honourable mention to um, another person that I used to be in touch with, and I think you were too, Clyde, but we lost touch over the years, was Lee Mansfield, Tony's brother. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, of course, he his vocals uh, uh, appeared on several new music tracks as, as a young kid. Yeah, they um, did. Such Island. as On Islands, and uh, later that track they did call Home, Planet Ha Ha. <coughs> yeah, uh, what, look at the skies now. Yeah, yeah, yeah which, that's right. Watch the skies now. <laughs> yeah, awesome and uh, a few other, a few, he was on a few other things as well, I believe. Uh, 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 on the over the three albums, I think um, one or two tracks. Um, yeah. And just to let you know that he, he, uh, if you were interested in like archive stuff that I've never heard up to that point of new music, he's got a couple of little um, gems on his own YouTube page. Oh, has he? Uh, his YouTube page is called Midwich Graffiti, as in Midwich Cuckoos. You know. Mid- um, Midrich Graffiti, that's Lee Mansfield's YouTube channel. Okay. And he's put up about four or five um, short uh, audio uh, clips of um, new music interviews, mostly with Tony, even one with Lee himself when he was young. Oh, right. Uh, okay. uh, from uh, Radio One and uh, Newsbeat and uh, Radio Jackie. Oh my uh, God, pro- Radio Jackie, yeah, yeah. Things like that that were promoting yeah. the albums at the time. So there's stuff there from, like, you know, uh, when they're just really straight lines uh, uh, and then uh, Living by Numbers and then later, later on uh, a bit of a promo about Warp and oh, all that right. stuff. So, yeah, oh, so God. it's well worth um, for you guys that would like to hear a bit of history there. I think that's a good place to go. Okay, I'll try that out. Maybe it's graffiti. Thank you for that, Frank. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to hear from you as well, Clive. Yeah, yeah. oh god, yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, if really. Leave a nice comment guy. on there or under the video or whatever. You oh, know. I shall do. I shall. <laughs> yeah. So I just thought I'd let you guys know that. I'm sure many of you on the YouTube, on, on the uh, sorry, on the Facebook page, are aware of it, of his channel anyway. But other people may not be, you know. Yeah. Um, and Lee, if you're out there, I hope you're doing well, mate. And um, you know, please get in touch sometime if you can. Love to hear from you. Oh, I'll, I'll check that out today and leave a comment. Uh, thank you for that, Frank. Yeah, you're welcome. Clive, um, once again, mate, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate this. Not at all. I I, I just hope I uh, was able to, uh, well, offer as much as, uh, let's put it this way. 
I appreciate I haven't been able to answer all of the questions because they're out of my remit, but uh, I have done my best. You have. And I think, and we got through all the questions as well. I made sure that I wanted to, everyone that sent me a question, I wanted to make sure everyone got, you know, got the question answered as much as, as best as best you could, you know? Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to, uh, you know, assist in any way I can. And we look forward to more from you, Clive. Um, okay. Whether that be your, you know, your solo stuff. Hopefully, that will see the light of day. Yeah. And also any new music, um, historical um, video, audio, whatever you know. Yeah, whatever I find, uh, I, 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 I'm happy to share it. Great stuff. All right, Clive. Thank you very much, mate. Okay. And, all uh, the best. Cheers, Frank. And thank you all for listening. And uh, take care. Bye bye. Yeah, thanks to everybody. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.